Hey guys, this video aims to answer the question, should you get a mid-90s gaming computer? Specifically one targeted at playing DOS and early Windows games circa 95 to 98. Sure, a heap of the most popular titles are available on GOG.com and Steam, and they've been ported to other systems over the years. But what if you already own physical copies of the games? Also, there are lots of hidden gems that I remember playing that aren't easy to get access to. Not to mention the countless variations on games and mods through the shareware scene. If you don't know much about DOS games, we'll cover some of the basics to help you jump in and get playing. We're also going to explore how getting a physical system compares to some of the emulation options out there at the moment, including DOSBox, ScumVM, and 86box. In the early 90s, most IBM PCs ran an operating system called DOS. It was a command line interface, meaning you had to type in things to interact with the computer, rather than using a mouse to point and click what you wanted. Whilst early versions of Windows had been around since the mid-80s, DOS had stuck around for its ease of use, but mainly due to limited hardware resources, as computers weren't adept at running multiple things at the same time. So if you booted your computer into Windows 3.1, say, you'd then be unable to run much else. So DOS lived on well past its 1981 release date, and games ran on it well into 95, 96, and 97. 1995 marked the release of Windows 95, and steady hardware improvements in computing meant DOS games were getting better and better. But around the mid-90s, something else happened. Two costly technologies that had been around for a while became affordable to the average PC user. Firstly came the CD-ROM drive, which allowed games to take up previously unfathomable storage space. And a little bit later, the dedicated 3D graphics card, which introduced 3D capability for home computers. What this meant was, games were suddenly ready to take some big leaps in graphics, audio and size. So Windows 95 was kind of a big deal, and although it still used a boot stage based on DOS, suddenly games were being made directly for it, or more specifically, something used to talk to hardware called DirectX. I won't go into too much detail, but basically this area of gaming was hugely transitional. You had some games made for DOS that could run in DOS or Windows, and others made directly for Windows. And yet worse, before the 3D architecture war was settled, some games only worked with some expensive video cards and not others. What a time to be a gamer. Thinking back on all this fondly, for some reason, I went out and bought a mid-90s gaming computer. This is a pretty good example of what you'd expect to find in stores around 1997. I will be seeking to upgrade certain aspects in the future, Currently, it has the following specs. This isn't really a video on shopping for these things, but generally speaking, the price of these machines is steadily increasing and it's starting to get a bit on the silly side. If you hunt around, you may pick something up for $50 to $100, but if you check out eBay, you're more likely to find them in the range of $150 to $350, depending on the conditions and what's included. Remember, you won't actually need a CRT monitor as most readily available 1080p LED monitors still have VGA inputs, which means you can still use these older PCs with prior gen, modern-ish monitors. Just remember, USB ports weren't available on most computers in this era, so get a keyboard and mouse with your purchase. A few tips to be ready for. Firstly, be prepared with software before you begin. System setup can take a while. If you're clean installing Windows, you'll likely need a boot floppy disk that lets your computer read its CD-ROM before you can begin the install. I know I had to scramble to find a copy. Tip 2. Have drivers and software ready for specific hardware you own. Luckily the internet makes this easier today. I eventually found the correct video card drivers, but you'll need to do a bit of a song and dance in regards to what driver you've chosen and what version of DirectX you've installed. Finally, how are you going to load stuff onto the PC? Hopefully you've got a CD burner, or make sure your computer has a network card, so you can readily transfer everything across. In my case, I didn't have any of this, and had to use an IDE to USB adapter to manually load everything. It took way too long. Three hours later. So in summary, my advice here is if you're going to set up one of these machines, make sure you're prepared with everything you need. 
drivers for everything, software, patches, disks, but most importantly, a method to transfer everything to the old system. Perhaps have a CD burnt and ready. It'll make the affair a whole lot more enjoyable. So with the Pentium 200 physical machine already set up, let's run through a few games to see how they work. We won't focus too much on the games in this video, but perhaps we'll take a look at this more in the future. Let me know if you'd like to see that. So first up, we'll use this handy PC PowerPlay demo CD, which has a range of shareware games on it from the mid-90s from a bunch of different genres. It'll be a good comparison to see how the emulators perform too. So first up, one of my all-time favourite FPS games, Duke Nukem 3D, a classic which I think still holds up today. This is the shareware version, so obviously it's a bit different to the final release, but we'll just go through the basics of the setup nonetheless. You can see it's version 1.1, .1. so there are a number of things uh, changed for the final release and obviously the inclusion of all the extra levels and chapters you get to play through. So with set uh, install complete rather, we just need to set up the audio. Uh, so the ESS audio drive installed in this system is basically a Sound Blaster clone. I believe it is. Uh, it should work with the default Sound Blaster or compatible version there. And I believe we need to use Wave Blaster here for the music. Let's see how this goes. Not the uh, best sounding sound card, but look, it does the job. Just uh, increase that brightness slightly. should say it does um, look a fair bit clearer in person. Uh, my VGA uh, capture device isn't the best. But you definitely get the gist of the game here. Dang, those aliens bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. And everything looks to be running pretty smoothly. Is great. Now I am using the keyboard here. I haven't set up the mouse, so no judgment. But yeah, that was uh, Duke Nukem running pretty fine. Next up, let's try a, a classic point and click adventure game from LucasArts. Uh, it's The Dig. So once again, we will just do some basic audio setup. I was just thinking if we should try Pro there, but we'll just do a 
Ward Edge Attack. No, that's good. You are Commander Boston Lowe, NASA's best shuttle jockey. There's a bit of a buffering lag there for the CD-ROM to read the uh, You've data. You've been enlisted to command a space shuttle mission to correct the orbit of an errant asteroid. Other than that, it looks no like it's uh, prepare you for what would happen next. loaded pretty well. There's no issues playing this back. I'm not sure. This sure doesn't look like the inside of that asteroid. Nope. There's a sky now. Load a space shuttle Atlantis. Come in, Atlantis. Static. We must be out of range. Yeah, but how far out of range? So it looks like the uh, music and audio voice acting is working as intended next up we're gonna try conquest of the new world a pretty snazzy turn-based strategy game with uh, exploration aspects so I'll just go through that setup and we'll skip ahead the intro. History, humanity believed that the world was flat. That its edges, guarded by dragons and sea serpents, led to the primal abyss. It was a world of superstition. The dark ages of mankind. And so it looks like the uh, full motion video works pretty well. I don't actually have a mouse on me at the moment. The other one stopped working, uh, so we can't go any further. But uh, yeah, the game seems to be working fine. Next up, it's actually a Windows-based game, Time Commando. Out of the controls for this. This game was quite cutting edge around this time. Believe it or not. Whoop! Just got uppercutted and headbutted. What is the punch button? There we go. <laughs> we'll just run away casually. But uh, yeah, there you have it, Time Commando running pretty smoothly. Next up is the rather quirky racing title, Fatal Racing. So this was a Sega Rally style a racing game which had stunts. As you can see. And it was kind of cool back in the day. Uh, whoops, looks like a memory error there. Um, so we've run this in Windows uh, command line DOS mode. So we'll restart in MS DOS and hopefully that works a bit better. And there we go. So there's a taste of a few different style games. I've already touched on the effort involved to get the physical P200 machine set up. It looks like it needs some further tweaking to get everything working. I still need to get a serial mouse for it. Two laps remaining. Next let's take a look at an emulation option in DOSBox. DOSBox is an open source emulation program that works on a few different platforms. Windows, Mac OS X and Linux. 
and works with a long list of DOS games. It also emulates 286 and 386 CPUs, range of graphics modes, and sound card options. It has pretty much worked with most games I've thrown at it. It may seem obvious here from the name, but it does only target DOS, so those era borderline games that you may remember running in Windows 95 won't work here. But let's take a look at some of those games. First up, we should make sure our drive is mounted. Basically that command above means that our local directory on our computer will be mounted to drive C. We can get further instructions by typing intro which will explain all the details required. For example, I can't change the CD-ROM drive because I haven't mounted it. So let's go through the introduction. So we can see there's a specific command there that needs to be typed to mount the CD-ROM drive, which basically means we have access to it from within DOSBox. In our case, we've actually mounted a directory on C drive to the CD-ROM, so not the physical CD-ROM drive itself. In that directory, we've copied uh, CD-ROM files, and now we can access them as if they were a CD-ROM. Alrighty, here's the Duke 3D install. And as you can see, the uh, emulated sound card here for the background music is a fair bit better than the ASS audio drive on the uh, physical 90s computer. Now I have enabled mouse here, just with a rough mapping of keys. And it's been a long time since I've played this. But as you can see, everything seems to be working fine. There's uh, not really any discernible lag either. I do realise this is not a game review, but man it's easy to get carried away in Duke Nukem 3D. And there you have it. We'll skip ahead and take a look at the dig. in Central America. Don't you agree, Dr. Brink? So flawless uh, audio coming through there. No, not primitive, exacting, precise. Each edge a perfect fit, even after millennia of negligence. Robbins. This place is incredible. I can't believe what we found. If we ever get home, what a story we'll have. 
Alrighty, let's not get carried oh away playing the dig demo. But uh, yeah, it looks like the uh, full motion video intro and game works fine. That its edges, guarded by dragons and sea serpents, led to the primal abyss. It was a world of superstition. And uh, some actual footage of Conquest of the New World being played. So the intro ran fine. So yeah, pretty impressive. Uh, by DOSBox here. And running another great game quite easily. There you have it. Finally, let's take a quick look at Fatal Racing. And it's running pretty sweet. No major lag and easy to set up. So there you have it, that's uh, DOSBox. <laughs> Next up, let's take a look at ScumVM. ScumVM isn't actually an emulator. It actually targets the specific games and rewrites the executable to work on modern systems whilst using the rest of the game's assets in place. The platform support here is actually super impressive. You can run it on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Amiga, Android, Atari, iOS, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo Switch, PS3, PSP, even the Sega Dreamcast, and much more. So many upsides in terms of where you can run things. It's actually my go-to program for playing games if they don't work in DOSBox. That said though, ScumVM only targets adventure and RPG games from a select few studios. But that is still a huge list of games. And so here's an example of loading a game which I've already got installed. We can't test any of the other games we've shown so far because they aren't supported by ScumVM. And so here's our game. We basically point it to the directory where we've got it installed. And we get a bunch of configuration options for that executable. We can configure a bunch of things, graphics, sound, key setup, and so on. And that's basically it. It's pretty straightforward, but it does do the job. And so we can actually load the game here in windowed mode. We can play full screen, obviously. We'll just show the intro. I'm back. And there you have it. That is ScumVM. Another great option for playing old DOS games. Lastly, let's now take a look at probably the most in-depth option. 86Box is a low-level x86 emulator that runs older operating systems and software designed for IBM PC systems and compatibles from 1981 through fairly recent system designs. What this means in practice is, unlike DOSBox which automatically emulates an x86 PC in order to run DOS for you, with 86Box you have the option to customize and configure every detail of the emulated machine. There are pre-set up ROMs to download, which means you can choose specific machine specs, CPU, video card, sound, hard drive, peripherals, even specific BIOSes. In order to run it, you do need to be on a Windows machine. This sounds complicated, and it certainly can be, 
You'd only really choose this option if you were having trouble running a specific game and needed to emulate its requirements exactly. But let's walk through the basics to get it up and running. We'll actually emulate the specs of the physical machine we've already set up. So let's kick it off. So we've already got 8.6 Manager installed and set up here. We're going to add a new virtual machine, call it P200 Gaming. Give it a description which makes sense. And now we need to configure the machine. We need to select our machine type. So we'll go for socket 7. Uh, we'll pick a Intel Advanced BIOS and we'll choose a 200 MMX, which is what our 90s PC was. And in terms of RAM, we'll go 64. Video card. 3D effects, Voodoo Benchy. Uh, it's already set to 16 meg, which is what is in the other machine. And we'll make sure we have a mouse. Bunch of different sound blasts, the choices. We'll just go for 16. For now, we'll try the uh, Roland MT. We'll go back and configure that later. We can just use a standard IDE controller. And our new hard drive. We'll just make it 2 gig. Uh, whoops, we need to give it a file name. So this will actually be the image. that it saves as so we'll put it in there because it belongs to that machine So we will need a floppy drive uh, of the 1.44 meg variety. That will do there. And we also need a CD-ROM. Let's go for an, a tuppy. And we, we could max this out, but we'll just choose a mid-range speed of 24 I can leave all that all that other stuff default alrighty we'll kick this machine off and we'll get an error because we will not have anything installed But we can hop into BIOS. Uh, not exactly used to this uh, version, or this brand of BIOS rather, but um, look, they're all the same. You just have various options in different locations. Uh, so that's what we're looking for, boot options. Uh, so we want the floppy 
uh, drive first because then we'll be able to boot into our Windows CD or our image of a CD rather. So we're going to change those, save those changes rather, and Oh, yep, okay, so we need to actually mount the floppy disk. So we'll just hop out of full screen and we will do that here. So we need to select an image for that floppy disk. Now there are um, images for this available online and again um, information in the description below. I've already pre-downloaded it and I'm keeping it there. It's a Win98 uh, boot disk. Now we also want to uh, mount the CD-ROM. So they are inserted there, so the image of the Win98 install CD and the boot floppy are mounted. Alrighty, so we can start Win98 setup from CD-ROM. There's the uh, Tarpy driver being installed. Alrighty, so we do need to format the hard drive. Now I'm not going to uh, go through all of the Windows uh, setup, which is quite a long process. But that should get you on your way. Three hours later. And there you have it, our Windows 98 first boot inside 86 box. Uh, there's still a bunch of setup to do, drivers and software and so forth need to be loaded. But uh, yeah, we are, we've got the base OS in place and we're ready to go. Now next up, uh, we need to burn a CD into an ISO image so um, 86 box can read it. One of the downsides of 86 box is that you can't simply insert a CD and have it mounted virtually inside 86 box. You need to actually uh, predefine an image ISO file, uh, which then you can use to mount in 86 box. So you can either you can use various uh, image burning software. Again, this uh, the link to this one will be available in the description below. Um, but be it a CD that you actually want to turn into an image or files on your hard drive that you want to turn into an image, uh, this is the best way to actually load stuff into 86 box. So what we're doing here is we've got a predefined folder on our computer um, with a bunch of shareware DOS games, which we've previously tested. And we are creating creating an image there which has completed so now that folder can be mounted virtually as a CD-ROM so we'll do that here in 86 box manager um, so there's our we've just made a folder there called CDs so this is we probably could have named it something a bit better than ISO but uh, yeah, we mount that in, and, and when we switch to the CD-ROM drive, we have our shareware games that we're going to test. All 
Alrighty, so we're going to have to change some of those settings we set up before. We're going to revert our Pentium 200 to a 75, and that is purely down to my PC not being good enough to emulate uh, a Pentium 200 MMX. So we've dropped it to a 75 uh, with 16 meg of RAM. Um, we've dropped the Banshee down to 8 meg. Um, we've removed um, some audio emulation as well. Um, and a bunch of other things. So every extra thing you emulate um, is harder to uh, get that cycle accuracy happening um, and maintained to run games properly. What we're actually getting, um, just if you're interested, is um, a fair bit of audio lag on some of the full motion videos. Uh, so we've, yeah, we've reconfigured our VM. Um, luckily you don't actually need to alter um, anything inside the VM. You usually get prompted. If you do change uh, RAM for example you get prompted that it needs to be and you need to enter BIOS and save settings. Ah, we did that and uh, yeah we're back essentially. Uh, just the equivalent of switching a CPU and some other things in and out um, and hopefully this should run better. Uh, next up, here's just uh, some uh, drivers that I also added to that image that I burnt earlier. I reburnt it. Um, and we're going to install drivers for the Vuru Banshee inside the VM. So it uh, runs a fair bit better. And there we go, it's all set up. And these drivers are available in the description below. Alrighty, and here we are inside DOS. And we're running the dig. The uh, full motion video running nicely. There's no lag, uh, and more importantly, there's no audio lag, which is what I was getting with a higher spec emulation earlier. Stranded on a desolate alien world, your crew. Let me just uh, skip ahead. No, not primitive, exacting, precise. Each edge a perfect fit, even after millennia of negligence. Alrighty, next up we will roll over to the Conquest directory. And uh, kick off this demo. I believe that's the right file. No, we've got a <laughs> all important registration there. And here's some actual uh, battle mechanics in Conquest of the New World. No, oh, poor shot, mate. But yeah, uh, full motion video and in-game 
stuff running perfectly in its Xbox. Alrighty, next up it is Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, now surprisingly here, this struggled a bit. Um, decided to turn the sound off. Come get some. Well, sound as in music that is. Damn, um, and you can see some of the frames being dropped here. If I had this running in windowed mode, you'd see the cycle accuracy dropping to about 80%. Again, this is down to my host computer not being the best spec-wise. Uh, with any modern-ish computer, you should get this running fairly well. Um, but, you know, results may vary. Alrighty, next up we have Fatal Racing in 86 Box. It's Fatal Racing! Uh, whoopsie. So we actually had the same error that we got on our uh, 90s gaming computer. Um, I did manage to screen cap what we need to do, is, which is restarting in MS-DOS mode, um, which just gives us a bit of extra memory for the way that that game has been written. Two laps remaining. Um, and here's the end result. A little bit... Uh, a little bit jerky there, um, frame-wise. Again, not as good as DOSBox. Um, and certainly not as good as the mid-90s gaming computer. But once again, um, similar to Duke 3D. If you have a host machine with better specs, uh, you should see a much better performance. I've actually dropped some of the draw distance and uh, cloud detail well, off here and it's still lagging a fair bit so there you have it and finally here we have time commando on 86 box so we originally ran this on the 90s machine and it ran near perfectly. So we're running here in, in Windows as well because Time Commando is made for DirectX. And it's actually running pretty well. I was expecting it to struggle a bit more. Um, some of that panning was a little bit slower than it should have been. But overall the action and gameplay isn't hindered as much, not as much as uh, Duke 3D and Fatal Racing. And so there you have it. What is the best way to play classic 90s games? A physical system? DOSBox? Scum VM? A6 box? I guess at the end of the day you could say whatever is easiest to get the game running but should you buy a mid-90s gaming computer? I think the only reason to do it would be if you really have an affinity for the hardware. Some people might say, what's the point? I can buy this on GOG.com for $5. But you could probably say the same for a lot of things in today's world. Why buy a physical book when you can have an e-reader? Why buy a vinyl record when you have Spotify? Why buy a classic car that is a nightmare to maintain when you can buy something new and simple? The final answer comes down to each to their own. For now at least, I'll wheel out the Pentium 200 when I want to play a certain classic game in a certain way. 
and I'll probably stick to one of my emulation options in between. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time.